Moscow, Russia's capital, largest city, and the biggest city in Europe. It's also the world's most expensive city. While all that makes it unique, it has something in common with a much smaller city 100 miles to its south. Moscow is among 12 Russian cities awarded hero city status, bestowed for its stand against the Germans in World War II. It shares that honor with Tula, a city of 600,000 people, still catching up from the hardships endured during that war and from decades of Soviet rule when Moscow's financial spigot allowed a mere trickle of cash. Our story really begins en route to Tula. While Moscow has modernized, the miles between the two cities remains rural. But change is occurring. Something as simple as roadside gas stations. A few years ago, you'd pull up for a fill-up from a tanker truck. As we approach Tula, the countryside, lush and undeveloped, begins to show signs of growth. The old wood houses give way to light industry, much like you'd see on the outskirts of any American city. And then the city limits defined by high-rise apartment buildings, many in what's called the Soviet style, large, unadorned, and now showing signs of wear. Although Moscow is the big city, Tula has a special distinction. Since 1991, it's been Albany, New York's sister city. The sister city concept dates back to the 1920s, formalized in the 50s. It's a worldwide endeavor, fostering economic and cultural exchanges and collaborations. Yes, of course, it's worth and it's very interesting. Uh, First of all, because uh, the, one of the most important things is uh, the information exchange flow. That exchange of ideas, thanks to the alliance, is part of what helped reshape Tula in the years since the restructuring and reformation of all that was the USSR, known as Glasnost and Perestroika. Today, Tula is considerably different from the city that greeted visitors before 1991. Nina Reich, a member of the Albany-Tula Alliance, remembers this city by the Upper River back then. What was it like here? Dark. Moscow, too. Uh, this was the first time I ever came, uh, and it was with a tour group because they said it was better to come with a tour group. Uh, they literally, even in Moscow, rolled up the sidewalks. Today, Tula is not only bright, but the churches, once shuttered or pressed into service other than for prayer, have been restored and worshipers freely attend services. Though a large statue of Lenin still looms over Tula City Square, its shadow is short. Entrepreneurs line the outside walls to Tula's original city limits and its Kremlin. Yes, Tula has a Kremlin, as do many Russian cities. Kremlin means fortified citadel, built to protect citizens centuries ago from invaders. Nowadays, Tula's Kremlin opens its arms to all comers as a tourist attraction. There's a military museum, and performers reenact historic battles. And again, religion, so long suppressed under communist rule, is literally being uncovered in Tula's Kremlin. As Tula rebuilds in the post-communist era, it also restores. These are the footings of the original bell tower that once stood behind the cathedral. It had been torn down by the communists. And there's more, an assortment of places to buy goods and stores that are well stocked. We started at Tula's venerable outdoor central market. You can furnish your home, dress your family, and feed them as well from the booths and stalls that cover at least half an acre, if not more. It's cheaper to buy some goods here, uh, but of course a lot of people go to the modern malls, for example, so it's convenient for them. Tula is known for making armaments and ironworks, for making those big Russian teapots, the samovars, and also for making honey cake, which is more like a gingerbread to our taste. But for the past 16 years, it's also had another bit of notoriety as Albany's sister city. While the ironworks and munitions factory were the city's economic backbone, those industries left a devastating legacy, pollution. Our city is a large industrial uh, city, and here we have a lot of children who have different kinds of respiratory problems. Add exhaust from buses and cars that, until recently, ran on leaded gas, and you've got a toxic mix. 
вот такими исследованиями. In uh, Tula region, uh, life span for male uh, citizens are uh, 58 years, and for women it's 60, 62 years. And in the United States, it's, uh, it may be uh, like 20 years more. Moreover, the death rate and birth rate are about equal, and infertility is an ongoing problem. For the children who are born, many have asthma or other respiratory ailments. That's clear as we visit one of Tula's polyclinics specializing in children's health. Right, about five years ago, we created here a city center for treating respiratory pathologies. Our tour gives us a glimpse of the programs to help youngsters build muscle tone and improve lung function. Old world tonics and herbal teas are also part of the treatment. How to best combat the pollution is an ongoing topic of discussion between researchers in Albany and Tula. This project was discussed uh, for the first time 10 years ago, and it concerns, it's a joint project that concerns um, problems caused by uh, environmental pollution and uh, its uh, influence on children and their health. Uh, and in Albany, you have uh, a group of uh, experts that are working at this problem. While Tool has been swapping the fume belching buses for greener vehicles, there's another environmental poison they're dealing with. The fallout from Chernobyl in 1986. The 300 miles between the two cities was not enough to spare Tula the consequences. We, uh, who live in the uh, Tula region, uh, we are, so to say, the lab mice uh, that uh, should be studied uh, to learn better uh, what the influence of uh, cesium and uh, Chernobyl uh, catastrophe in general can be and uh, what treatments are necessary uh, to overcome this problem. Dr. Kachuram says sharing information with his counterparts at the Sunni School of Public Health is the easy part. It's getting the biological samples across the miles that's tough. So he's discussing a dream project. We uh, spoke of the possibility to create uh, two laboratories, uh, one at uh, SUNY University and the other at the Tula State University, um, which would uh, contain um, similar equipment and uh, which would work on the uh, same methodic basis and uh, this way we would be able uh, to uh, hold the researches here and uh, to provide uh, the information for the um, for the University uh, of Albany yes first time well, but I want you that uh, he, uh, everybody who comes to Tula uh, is being infected with Tula virus once he came to Tula he'll come <laughs> here again and again <laughs> Treatment for a virus well, Elaine, is a healthy Elaine. dose of medical business and cultural exchange along with enduring friendships. <laughs> the contagious enthusiasm began 16 years ago when Tula, Russia and Albany, New York became sister cities. The need for exchange is as vital now as when the alliance began. With the partnership, we believe that most important is exchange of experience, technologies, medical equipment, and we need to learn from your system about the family doctors, that's what we call our general practitioners. So that is invaluable. For decades, Russian doctors, predominantly women, occupied the low end of the financial totem pole. Bus drivers made a better living. But as the Soviet Union crumbled, the situation for health professionals began to improve. Change was fueled by an awareness of how Western medicine is practiced. That's now opened the doors to the sharing of information about family practitioners. One doctor to oversee a patient's health, instead of a collection of specialists who don't really know the patient. It has been an old Russian tradition, family doctors, but it was scrapped by the Soviets. In the past, it would be at least two or three specialists because I had to go to the therapist and I had to go to a specialist on neuropathology and to a specialist on blood pressure. And if she can't make it to the doctor's office, the doctor will make a house call. It's commonplace. <laughs> 